system this morning. Um, I want to give a big special thanks to our funders. Oh, you can't see my pretty face. Um, I want to give a special shout out to our funders. Uh, the McKnight Foundation has been supporting us for a couple of years, allowing us to develop this workshop series. And uh, for the second year in a row, we have Excel Energy as our series sponsor. I'm grateful to have them as a series sponsor to support the whole series of workshops. Uh, really helps us make these possible. So I'm very happy to have them here. And they have resources back on the table. And Yvonne and Mike are both here and can answer questions. Um, and if they don't know the answer, they'll make some, no, they won't make something up. They will find the answer for you. So um, I, I do the social media for people who don't know that. And so um, I like to do things on the Twitter and say what cities are, you know, kind of peg cities. I just have to read to you this list of cities that are either in the room or on the webinar because it's pretty cool. Uh, Moorhead, Shorewood, Northfield, Hutchinson, St. Paul Park. Lauderdale, Cologne, Royalton, Isanti, Brooklyn Center in the house, uh, Arlington, Maplewood, Fridley, Hennepin County, Delano, St. Louis Park, St. Paul Park, Coon Rapids, St. Anthony, Hastings, Ambergrove Heights, and Red Wing. Those are all the cities that are participating in this workshop today. So I think that's incredible um, to have um, such an interest in energy. Of course, I'm a little biased because that's what I work on. Um, so a couple of announcements. Um, several announcements actually. For those cities out there, there's an um, opportunity, a uh, sustainable communities partnership that's um, out of St. Thomas. Um, they're doing, uh, they're inviting proposals right now for cities to be a pilot partner um, to advance their sustainability goals. I have sheets here to share with folks. Um, if you're interested to find out more, um, if you want to be a city partner, it's somewhat like the regional um, or the Resilient Communities Project that the university does, working with the community to really help them advance their sustainability goals. So it's a very cool opportunity. Cities that are interested will include information in the follow-up for those that are on the webinar. Uh, secondly, um, for those who know, um, CERT, sorry, CERT it has uh, a number of resources including seed grants. We do seed grants every couple of years and we are currently in that period. So October 26th, seed grants are due to help fund labor only for clean energy projects across the state. So no matter where you are in the state, you can apply to your region. And there's more information. We'll send out uh, follow-up stuff, but I have information if anybody's interested. Sh you know, if your city's not interested, but you know a community organization, entity, school, congregation that might be interested, please forward it on to them. Um, we're really excited about um, funding great projects. Um, and then for those who are familiar with Metro CERT, we have an annual event. It's coming up next week on, thir on Thursday. Um, the interesting thing this year, um, it's the 22nd from 3 to 7, will be that we will have an opportunity to provide feedback into the Minnesota uh, 2025 Energy Action Plan. So folks will be able to um, kind of give their input about what they see as the future of energy for Minnesota and what they need, what are the barriers, those kinds of things. Um, there will be an opportunity here in the Metro next week there are also three other um, venues that CERTS is hosting um, in Greater Minnesota, and we'll send a link so that you can find out more information on how you can participate in that. Um, I have a couple of Green Step Cities flyers and workshops and such, um, but uh, I just want to make sure that I um, tell you a tiny bit about Green Step Cities. It's a program that launched in 2010, so we're in our fifth year, or I guess sixth year technically. Um, and it's a set of best practices to help cities with whatever their goals for sustainability are, to help move them along, help give them resources, uh, connect them to guidance, other cities that have done something similar. Uh, it's become a really, really robust program. And I think we have 87 cities now, which is really, really cool. Um, so a, more than a tenth of the cities. Is that right, Mayor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just caught him off guard. Um, and so I think that's all I'll say, but I do want to share, we have a great, great, great Plains Institute, a new Green Corps member, Manny Norgard, and um, she has um, energy efficiency opportunities uh, for assisting cities that she will talk about for a few minutes before we get started. So, Maddie. Yeah, thanks, Diana. Oh, I didn't have the microphone. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, my name is Maddie Norgard and I'm a Minnesota Green Corps member, um, which is a program supported by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. 
My host site is Great Plains Institute in the Metro Clean Energy Resource Team, um, and I'm here to just talk briefly about the Clean Energy Accelerator that is an initiative of the Metro CERTS team, um, and this program aims to connect communities and individuals to the resources that they need to implement community-based clean energy project, projects. Um, specifically, this year we're running a clean energy accelerator program that's geared towards energy efficiency projects for public buildings. Um, so any community or individual in the 11 county metro region can apply for assistance with implementing energy efficiency projects. And so we can help with identifying the technical and financial resources that are needed to implement projects. We can help with the planning process. And we can also help measure energy use and savings through, savings through the V3 um, benchmarking program. So all local governments in the 11 county metro region are eligible. Um, and right now, we have not put up our request for proposal on our website. Um, but if you're interested, you can contact me and I can send you a request for proposal, an application which goes through the details of what type of projects are eligible. And um, these applications will be reviewed on a rolling basis. So the sooner that you're able to apply for this program, the better the chance that our staff will have the capacity to assist you. Um, so feel free to contact me with any questions that you may have, and um, I look forward to answering your questions after the workshop. So thank you. Thanks, Mandy. I'm back. Now I have a microphone, although I'm pretty sure everybody can hear me. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, so the agenda. It is on the screen. Um, those of you in webinar world should be able to see it as well. Um, really want to thank our uh, <coughs> Green Set City Coast partner, um, the U.S. Green Building Council of Minnesota and um, Great Plains helped um, put this together. We really appreciate all the work that everybody did to put this in. Katie, where's Katie? Thank you, Katie. Katie Anthony from the USGBC really helped put some um, work behind us to put together a really good workshop so that we could get the most out of today. Um, so I will be introducing my lovely friend Allison from Fresh Energy. Um, she's wicked smart, um, and she's going <laughs> to kick us off um, with numbers and efficiency and things that will blow your mind. Um, so um, Allison's going to. Um, she comes from Fresh Energy. Her bio is on the screen. I won't read it because it's pretty long. She's pretty accomplished, and um, I think I'll just turn it over to Allison. Thanks, Allison. Eleven. It's eleven. Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, there was a little confusion there over whether I had ten minutes to speak or twenty-five, which is what the slides were for. So um, <laughs> now we know. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I um, and thank you, Diana, for the lovely introduction. It's funny that she said I'm wicked smart because I used to live in Boston. Um, so <laughs> um, I am the one of the policy directors at Fresh Energy, and I'm the director of our building program. So basically, Fresh Energy is a nonprofit organization. We've been in Minnesota for over 20 years, and we work on public policies related to clean energy and energy efficiency. And um, I was asked to come here today to talk a little bit about benchmarking from um, a local, regional, and national perspective. And um, because we're also doing this in partnership with the U.S. Green Building Council of Minnesota, I'm going to be giving a general overview of some of uh, what benchmarking actually is, what some of the different types of benchmarking are, what different benchmarking policies are. Um, and uh, what some of the most common programs for benchmarking are. Now, as you guys probably know in the room, uh, if you're a green step city, I think of the A or B category, um, you do have to benchmark your city building. So I assume that most people in this room know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about benchmarking. But just in case, 
Oh my gosh, I'm doing this backwards. Here is a general definition of benchmarking for you. So benchmarking in and of itself is just recording and tracking and looking at your energy consumption. So it's really easy. It can be as simple as just looking at your energy bills every month. But there are kind of three different ways to do energy comparison. So the first one is benchmarking against your own buildings. So this is really important when you want to find out how your buildings are performing over time. And this is basically the very first step of benchmarking. And while it may seem like uh, not that big of a deal, it can also help you understand where some of your risks lie in some of your buildings because maybe if you're looking at your building every month, all of a sudden you have a huge spike in energy and you can say, oh, you know, winter is coming, maybe my HVAC system is not doing so well. So um, baseline and benchmarking against your own uh, building is really important. Um, the second one is what this slide calls the Energy Star Portfolio Manager Approach. I would also put this in the same category as the B3 benchmarking system. Basically what that means is it's a system that you enter your energy into and it compares it against other buildings. So a lot of other buildings also exist in the system and you can look at your building versus a building that is very similar in style, in age, in its heating systems and those type of things. And um, that's really important because it can help you actually set goals and understand maybe my building isn't performing as well as I thought it was. It seems to be performing for itself really well over the last five years, but why is the building down the road that was exactly the same using half as much energy? So it can get you to kind of that point. And then the third kind of way of using benchmarking in comparison is actually to get a kind of score for your building. So in this particular explanation, um, it combines both of those two. So it sets a baseline based on all of the information of all of those other buildings. So if you are using Energy Star Portfolio Manager, for example, you can get an Energy Star score. And then you'll know whether your building is actually considered via this score a high performing building in the middle or a low performing building. And I know that this is really fuzzy, uh, I apologize for that, but I think this is an important slide to understand. Benchmarking is the very first step of achieving energy efficiency. Without it, we don't actually know if we've accomplished anything and um, we don't know where we started. So the very first thing you want to do is make a commitment to look at your energy. The next thing you want to do is assess your performance. So that can mean assessing it against itself over the course of time or against other buildings, maybe using one of those rating systems. Then you set goals. So if you're a city, this may mean setting a goal like over the next three to four years, we're going to try to reduce our energy consumption in our buildings by 10%. You wouldn't be able to know if you actually achieved that goal unless you were benchmarking first and you continued to benchmark. And then all the rest of these steps, I believe we're going to learn about later today from our other speakers, but essentially that's when you create your action plan, you implement it, and then you evaluate whether you achieve your goals, and then you celebrate the fact that you achieve those goals, and then of course you go back and reassess. So I mentioned some of these benefits already, but there are a few additional ones. So the first benefit of measuring your energy is obviously comparing your energy consumption and getting an understanding of that. The second one is setting those goals, really important. Going beyond that, verifying that yes, you've completed what you set out to do, and then obviously earning recognition for it. So if you use one of those benchmarking programs, I'll be talking about them a little bit later, you can actually use that to achieve a specific certification, like LEED, for example. Without it, you might not be able to uh, receive that achievement. And then I think this is actually one of the most important parts of benchmarking, especially for cities, is for operations. And um, it can help you to understand and create annual energy budgets. It can help you to influence the behavior of your tenants. Just think for a moment, if you were to take one month and just ask everyone in your building to turn off their monitors, their computer monitors when they walked away from their desk 
and then turn them back on. And then if you could see the difference in your utility bills, you wouldn't be able to do something like that unless you were benchmarking your use. Um, and then also, it can be helpful in use of real estate transactions. So maybe on a city level, this isn't as important, but if you're a private building owner and you did some energy improvements, you would want to be able to demonstrate that this is how much it used to cost for your utility bill, and now this is how much it costs, and we're really committed to having a good, high-performing building for you. So I think we're all here for the same reason, energy efficiency, probably. Obviously, with benchmarking, that's the end goal. Um, and as a city, there are certain ways that you can achieve that from a policy standpoint. And one of those standpoints is with a benchmarking ordinance. Now, there are different ways to kind of say ordinance, so I'd rather say benchmarking policy. Um, you can have a voluntary benchmarking policy where maybe you ask buildings in your city to start benchmarking using the same program that you're doing. You could have um, a required benchmarking policy for all of your city buildings to be benchmarking, which if you're a green set city, you probably have something like that in place. And then the third level would be to require all the buildings within your city um, to be benchmarking. So just for the record, in case you didn't know, the city of Minneapolis is the only city in Minnesota that currently has that type of policy. And even with that type of policy, there are certain restrictions. So that, their policy, I'll talk about it a little later, but it's only for commercial buildings. So it's not really all buildings. So there are many different levels. And then um, you can use the benchmarking of those levels to measure your progress against the city goals or any kind of state goals that your city may care about. Um, if you have private buildings, that can help drive market transformation for energy efficiency. And you can also become connected with some of the existing utility programs. Um, because now you understand that your city has those goals and you can benchmark and, and uh, take advantage of those programs. So moving up the pyramid here, what we hope the end result is, is more energy efficient building stock. So let's look at this national map. I talked about kind of the three different tiers of um, policies that you can do around benchmarking and disclosure. Uh, this map does not reflect any of those city-wide um, policies because there would be too many on this map. Because uh, I believe, I looked this up, I think either 49 or 50 of the Green Step cities are doing benchmarking of their own city buildings. So the state of Minnesota itself would just have a bunch of dots all over it. But what this map shows instead is a commercial or commercial and multi-family benchmarking and disclosure policies. So this information is public information. Um, it also shows public buildings that are benchmarked, those are green, and it shows single-family transparency. So usually what that means is something um, on a real estate, trans real estate transactional side um, that, that, that energy information becomes disclosed. There are different levels for all of these different policies. One of the things I would like to note about this map, Minnesota was one of the first states in the United States to have public benchmarking requirements. Um, so we've been leading that for a long time. And the city of Minneapolis, with their benchmarking disclosure ordinance, was the first city in the Midwest to enact such a policy. The latest one on this map was Kansas City. And um, so the city of Minneapolis, we only do commercial buildings, and Kansas City does commercial and multifamily buildings. Anyway, I like this map. You can see that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of action going on. <laughs> you guys can read that, right? <laughs> just kidding. Um, I just put this up here to show. This is some of the policies and ordinances, I think that the list actually goes much further down, um, that are listed on that map. And the reason I show this is because they're all different. And I think that's really important because if you're a city and you're considering enacting some kind of policy related to benchmarking, you can really shape it for what is important to you and your city. You don't have to, um, there's not just one thing, one standard that you can adhere to. 
So I promise to talk about what's going on regionally. And um, this slide it kind of makes me laugh. You'll notice it's from March 2014. I couldn't find a more current slide, but I decided to keep it up because I thought that it would be great for you guys to see the progress that has happened since a year and a half ago. So um, the blue triangles represent legislation that is underway by municipalities. And again, this is something that um, would be publicly disclosed information for privately owned commercial buildings, not um, city owned buildings. And um, out of those blue triangles, the only one I know that has passed is the Kansas City one. Um, Madison has still been trying to get something passed down there. And I'm not sure what has happened in Ohio. I believe that Columbus, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have my geography with Columbus or with Ohio. It's not very good. Um, so it's, uh, some things have been moving forward, which is great. And then you see the Michigan is the blue hatched. Um, they were considering publicly owned uh, state buildings to be benchmarked, and they did pass that. So there has been some movement in the last year and a half in the regional side. So let's talk about um, Minnesota benchmarking policies. First of all, in uh, January of 2013, the city of Minneapolis passed um, uh, citywide benchmarking and public disclosure ordinance. So it applies to all buildings. Um, that are commercial, over 50,000 square feet, but does not include multifamily. And it also uh, applies to all of their city-owned buildings, I believe over 25,000 square feet. Um, they did it in a tiered approach, and so I believe that now all of those buildings are required to be um, uh, disclosing that information. And I will talk a little bit more about some of the results that they've already seen from um, this benchmarking disclosure ordinance a little bit. I would also like to mention that they use Energy Star Portfolio Manager for their um, benchmarking system. Minnesota Green Subsidies. You guys probably already know because you're all sitting here today, but uh, this is a voluntary uh, program. And if you are, I think it's, you guys call them tier A and B or city? Back. Step A and Step. Category. Category oh, A and B cities. So right, category right, right, C right, is right, not required. Right. So category A and B cities, which I believe is determined by size of city, um, they are required to at least benchmark their city-owned buildings. But they do have additional steps that go beyond, um, and you can get more uh, points and more steps for that. Okay. Um, and then uh, they use the B3 program, uh, B3 benchmarking program. And then last but not least, publicly owned buildings in our state, so state buildings are required to uh, benchmark their energy consumption data. And they're also required to look at um, any measures that might improve the energy efficiency of those buildings. And if you receive public funding for renovations, you also are required to benchmark your energy consumption data. State funding. So this is the... Um, these are the policies that we have in place in our state. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the benchmarking program that is uh, Minnesota specific. It's called the Minnesota B3 program. And basically, it's, it, I, I've heard it's really pretty easy to use. Um, you first go into the program, you enter in information about your building, the size, uh, type of energy source, um, type of heating and cooling system, uh, age of the buildings, all these things. Um, and then you enter in your energy use. And I believe, you guys should correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I mean, it's up to you as a city, but I'm just not sure what Green Step requires. You can do this on a monthly basis or you can do it annually. For B3 is monthly. Okay. Results out. Okay. It has to be monthly. It has to be monthly. So for B3, you have to do monthly. Um, and I like this slide because it shows all of the number of buildings that have already been put in here. Now, this slide is actually a little bit old as well. So I'm pretty sure this number has gone up. But uh, as you'll see, city buildings account for almost 25% of the buildings that we have in this program. So it's really great because if you want to compare 
um, building to building. And if you're in a city, you know that there's a lot of other city buildings that are in this program that are probably like your city building. One of the other great things about the B3 program is if you go to the website, you can actually pull down potential savings by sector. And um, I'm showing schools here. So about 70% of all of the schools have benchmarked one time in this program. Uh, that was because of a state law that was passed, um, I believe, in 2003. So they were all required to do it once. Some of them have kept it up and some of them haven't. So one of the things that Fresh Energy is working on is we're working on a bill that will, just like our public buildings are required to be disclosed, will require schools to disclose their information and benchmark it as well. So one of the reasons we think this is important is I know you guys can't read this, but if you go all the way over to the right, potential annual savings for public schools, $6 million a year. And when we have schools that are hurting so much and need money for their programs, for their teachers, we think that this is a really important place to start looking for that money. Um, so having all this information in one place is really interesting. If you guys haven't actually spent much time on this website, it's really fun if you happen to get into data and energy like I do. I wanted to just uh, throw this out there. So we have had a lot of support from a lot of schools around this idea of requiring benchmarking because a lot of them started benchmarking and then started saving a lot of money. So Albert Lee, for example, when they started benchmarking 10 years ago, they discovered one of the things that um, was happening was that their pool was one of their biggest energy consumers. And so they found a solution. They got pool covers. Their mechanical cost a little bit more than the manual kind, but they made all the janitors and everybody happy that they didn't have to manually pull these um, pool covers back and forth. I think the payback was about four years on that, and that they still have managed over 10 years to save $3 million. And what they did was they actually hired a guy to be a part-time basically facilities energy person, and he tracks their energy use, and he walks around, and he says to the teachers, oh, you know, you're not using these computers right now, you should probably shut these off. And he, he does that, and so it's more behavioral, they've seen more on the behavioral side than on the having to implement um, big construction changes into their um, facilities. And I think that's a really important point, because Without benchmarking, they wouldn't be able to understand that they were actually seeing those savings. And without benchmarking, they wouldn't have been able to know that they should have done that in the first place. And so even, you know, you don't have to hire somebody to just look at that, but this school did, and they still save $300,000 a year, which goes back into their school program. So I talked about B3. That's um, one of the most common benchmarking systems we have here in the state. And I think we'd say the second most common is Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And that's the one that um, the city of Minneapolis uses. I do want to mention that um, if you enter your information into Energy Star Portfolio Manager, it can be um, pushed through to B3. So you can use both programs if you like. So a Portfolio Manager typically, um, measures commercial buildings. You can do energy and water and um, greenhouse gas emissions. They do have an industrial one now too. And I think most people use it for commercial. And uh, the tool also calculates uh, score. Like I mentioned, it's that third way of um, finding that asset rating. And so it goes from 1 to 100, 100 being the best. I should say best, but highest performing of all of the buildings. And it does that using all the information from all of the buildings of a certain um, type or of a certain facility um, to achieve that score. So because of that, on the bottom, you'll see that only 21 types of facilities can actually achieve a score. So you can still use Energy Star Portfolio Manager, and I'm making this up because I don't know, but um, let's say you're measuring your post office. I don't think that you can get an Energy Star post office because there aren't enough post offices in their, um, in their 
system. <laughs> um, but there are 21 other types that you can get. Uh, even without it, though, it's a really good management tool for comparison. And if your facility does have a score of 75 or higher, then you can become eligible to apply for the Energy Star certification and get your um, accolades for having a higher performing building. I should mention that both of these tools that I've talked about are free. Um, one of the other great things, just like B3, how you can come up with different reports, you can do the same thing for Energy Star. And Energy Star allows you to put in performance goals as well. So you can start, um, you can create reports and see where you are in your building and if you're hitting those performance goals. So I promised to talk about the city of Minneapolis and some of the results um, from their benchmarking ordinance. So the first year that was reporting, they did city buildings only, and then they had a couple of other entities that agreed to be part of that first year. I believe it was uh, Minneapolis Public Schools and kind of a county, and um, maybe it was Minneapolis Parks, I think, too. Um, and they came up with a report. And then the second year, it was buildings over 100,000 square feet, so privately owned commercial buildings plus all of those buildings from before. So this is the report based on that. And they discovered that uh, the median energy star score for all the buildings that were in that report was 64. 38 was for the public buildings, and then on the privately owned buildings was uh, 81. They got to remember, these are really like bigger size buildings, over 100,000 square feet. Um, office buildings were generally the higher performers and had an average energy star score of 87. One of the questions I get sometimes when I talk to people about benchmarking is that they're concerned that their older buildings are going to perform really poorly and they don't want to benchmark it. And um, they saw this the first year as well. Building age does not relate to energy performance. So of the below average performing buildings that they had, they discovered that they could save 43% on their energy costs if they just improved it to the current average. So that's not even improving above the average, that's just bringing it up to the average. They could still save 43% in energy costs. And of the buildings reporting, and remember again, over 100,000 square feet, hospitals, hotels, and schools have the greatest potential for energy savings. I just think this is important because if you're a city and you're benchmarking, this is the type of stuff that you can learn. You can learn where you should be putting your resources and you should be learning um, about you know, where you have the highest energy savings potential. And then just a very broad overview. Um, the EPA did a study of over 35,000 buildings and they discovered that just by benchmarking, not even by improving any kind of um, structural components, or by implementing behavioral programs, they found that over three years, you save an average of 7%. And that just happens because people start looking at their energy bills. And then an analysis also reveals that over 50% of the energy efficiency opportunities can be achieved through low or no cost improvements. And they're typically identified after benchmarking. And again, I think this is really important because if you're concerned that your building is a low performer and you think there's nothing I can do to don't have any capital to put into this, 50% of those energy savings on average could probably come from behavioral things or, or really low cost changes. So that's what I have for you today. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Allison? Um, so I um, mistakenly didn't mention New Hope, because New Hope's in the room. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, make sure that I did that. I, I'm still overwhelmed by how many cities we have involved today. It's really exciting. And a number of them are green set cities and some are not. So if you're one of those cities that are not yet a green set city, um, let us know how we can be helpful. Um, we can come out and do a presentation to city staff, the city council, to whoever you need to answer questions and share more about what the program is about and help you get on your way. Um, it's a 
pretty easy um, steps um, once you get kind of rolling. So um, <clears throat> next, I have the privilege of introducing my colleague. Hi, are you all ready? I'm all set. <laughs> you want to quote him? Okay. Um, so, um, really excited um, to work with uh, Peter Lindstrom. He is our local government outreach coordinator for the statewide search team, and um, he is here to talk about GESP. Um, I'm, I, we tried to have more acronyms for today, but we couldn't <laughs> possibly find any more acronyms. So, that stands for the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program, and um, so he's going to talk more about that and how he can be helpful with your city and Saving energy. Thank you, Diana. Oh, can you mention the hashtag? Do you know what it is? No. Okay. Sorry, um, I want to mention the hashtag. I don't know if it's up there. Oh, it's on the bottom of the, the screen here. Green Step W K S H. There's a P in there. Um, and it's usually on the agenda, but it's not. So you can just go to the Green Step. You'll find it. It's Green Step H P. Um, and um, follow us and tweet yourself. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, how are we doing? It's been a bit of a rough morning for me uh, so far. Uh, we had some technical difficulties. We got them worked out. Uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, Patrick, uh, first my flash drive didn't work. And then I uh, tried to log into the Wi-Fi. Then it kicked me out. Uh, I finally got my slides cooking, but I was thinking I have not had a, a worse start uh, since I uh, got back from a trip and my car would not start at the airport. This is in the evening, of course, in January. And um, I'm two hours away from my hometown. The car gets hauled off to a service station and I think, okay, we're getting the alternator fixed here. We're off and running. We're going to be going here pretty soon. Out of nowhere, two cop cars come by, surround the, the service station, and arrest the one and only mechanic. And it's in the middle of fixing my car. <laughs> this is terrible. We got it all fixed out, pick, uh, worked out, and, and we're good. So anyway, it's going to be a great rest of the morning. And, uh, we're off and running here talking about the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. Um, Diana talked about CERTs. Maddie talked about CERTs a little bit. Um, we are a partnership organization between the Southwest Regional Development Commission down in the southwest part of the state, the Great Plains Institute, which uh, Patrick and Diana are part of, uh, the University of Minnesota Extension, is part of CERTS, and our final, our fourth uh, partner is the state of Minnesota Department of Commerce. And we've been around for about a decade or so. And of course my slides are not advancing <laughs> at this point. Do I need to be pointing at anything, Patrick? Or I can just try it again. Bam! <laughs> All right. I was giving a similar presentation um, a week or so ago about PACE, Property Assets Clean Energy, and a woman in the audience says, hey, I think that's me on this picture. It's crazy. <laughs> so this is what we're talking about today. Uh, buildings, uh, we've got a real issue. There was a report put out about a year ago or so from the Rockefeller Foundation that does a lot of work on this. Topic, and they said, boy, if we got our act together, both private buildings and public buildings, we could be saving this amount of money, a trillion dollars a year, a trillion dollars a year. And I was talking to uh, someone in the private sector not that long ago, and um, I said, what's the deal with this? I mean, this is private sector money as well. Why are we not focusing on this? And he said, well, we're so, we in, in the, his particular business, so focused on um, achieving their mission, producing the medical devices that they're producing, the widgets, the whatever, that um, it's challenging to look at that HVAC system and say, you know, is that HVAC system that's been in the back room there, is that, is that working as efficiently as it possibly can? 
And he said once we did focus on it, our business saved or found one or two percent additional profit that we did not know that we had. And I think the same can be said for cities. Uh, I'm the mayor of Falcon Heights, and I know that each levy increase in our city, when we increase the levy one percent, that equals about ten thousand dollars. So I think that cities can focus on this and perhaps save one or two percent of a levy increase that they don't need to have um, if they focus on energy efficiency. So the state of Minnesota uh, recognizes this as an issue and has a wide variety of incentives and rebates and different initiatives uh, for the private sector and, and the public sector to tackle this problem. And GAST, the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program, is one of those initiatives. So I suspect these look pretty familiar to you as some of the, your challenges. Cities are being asked to do more with less. And you may have, of course, limited time, limited funds, uh, deferred maintenance. I heard the other day that the uh, Minsky, the Minsky campuses as a whole, they have one billion dollars in deferred maintenance. One billion dollars. And they can go to the legislature and get uh, keeper funds, you may be familiar with that, uh, uh, to address deferred maintenance, but they'll only get uh, I don't know, 50 million uh, every bonding year to get to get to address the, that deferred maintenance. So they've got a huge amount. Um, operational costs, your city council may be setting sustainability goals. So you have you have these challenges. So before I move on, um, I'll just address why did the state create the guaranteed savings program in the first place? Uh, the state has its own energy goals that it wants to accomplish. They have their own uh, greenhouse gas emissions that they want to uh, uh, lower and, of course, create jobs, similar to your city goals as well. So GESP encourages finding energy efficiencies and the use of renewables uh, by utilizing performance contracting. And the concept here is a Relatively simple one, you have your your utility budget right here. You've got uh, the costs and the uh, maintenance and operation costs. And you undertake um, energy efficiency measures and you use the savings to help pay for the project over time. And it's usually 15 years or 20 years or so. So after you make these improvements, you still have the same amount of money. Pie chart is still the same size. You still have energy costs. You still have some maintenance and operations costs. But you have this huge chunk of, of uh, green where the savings help pay for the work that was completed. So uh, the takeaway here is that, yes, the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program is budget neutral. There's two broad rules of thumb to make this work. The first is that the project itself should be, and again, again this is not set in stone, but generally speaking, the project should be about $300,000. Uh, I've been told that if, it's, if the project does not get up to that level, that for the companies that do this work, the juice isn't worth the squeeze for them to, to do the work. So roughly about $300,000. The second rule of thumb is that they, the company, uh, and you, the city, should be able to save approximately 20% on your utility um, spend. 
And again, that's just to make a project pay for itself over time. So if you're a larger city, say a St. Cloud or a, um, or Rochester, you could spend roughly $2 million in utilities a year. So you take 20% of that, uh, that's $400,000. And again, you pay for it over time, 15 years, maybe 20 years. So $400,000 each year, that's, a, that's $6 million to spend on, on these types of projects. If you're a smaller city, uh, maybe you spend um, $200,000 a year, and these are, uh, these are HVAC systems, this is building envelope stuff, this is uh, uh, street lights and lighting in general. So $200,000, 20% of that, $80,000 financed over 15 years, that's a project over a million dollars. If you're a smaller city, it gets a little bit more challenging. Um, you have less projects to do. And so what we found is, at least in one case, uh, Redwood County down in the southwest part of the state, relatively small county, they have joined forces with two small cities in their county to do one project together. And that's how they meet, that, meet those thresholds. So this, is, this slide just shows it in a, in a different way. You have your uh, existing energy and maintenance and operations costs. Uh, you use the uh, savings to help pay for the project, and then ideally you have ongoing savings. So what could you consider for projects? A few I've mentioned already. High efficiency boilers and chillers, converting to ground source heating, uh, geothermal, energy efficiency uh, or energy efficient lighting. That is a, a low hanging fruit that often drives these projects, transitioning to LEDs, installing heat recovery equipment, uh, redesigning HVAC systems, adding solar. Uh, renewables can be a, a part of. The, these projects and water conservation. It's not just electricity, but look at water conservation as well. And then, as, as I mentioned, um, building envelope. Uh, it, it, it's interesting what I've found working with cities, counties, and schools is that it's it's they may have goals to reduce their um, their uh, energy usage, but oftentimes what's driving these projects are comfort issues. So think about the building envelope and think if you have people sitting in cubicles or in their office next to windows that were installed in 1982, they're a little drafty, they're making their lives pretty miserable, and they're going to the city administrator every other day saying, come on, let's fix these, let's go, I'm sick of this. Or they're looking at um, the wall and it's got little black dots on it. Uh, mold, not so good. So they're like, hey, there's health and safety concerns here. Or think about mold in schools. Oh my gosh, and that is a huge deal, a huge deal. Um, you get teachers that are sick, you get kids who are sick, or you have old equipment. Um, in a school you have, uh, or a city, City Hall, you got old fans that are are buzzing. Think about that in a in a classroom and a teacher trying to yell over an old fan that's continually spinning. Oh, by the way, I have a picture of a goalie here. This may resonate. You may be wondering what in the heck uh, uh, he's putting this up for. But ice arenas are huge energy sucks uh, for cities. No surprise uh, to this. Crowd. And I've learned that that's the case in part because you are heating the the, uh, the ambient air, the air to keep your your hockey fans comfortable. You're freezing the ice, no surprise there. But then you're also heating the concrete below the ice 
because um, if you just put ice on concrete, the concrete will crack and heave. And so um, you have pipes running through the concrete that, that cools the, uh, uh, that uh, it gets the ice, um, makes the ice ice. And so um, you can't, you don't want to be heaving the, uh, the concrete because those, those, crack, or those uh, pipes will, will crack as well. So it's, it's sort of a battle, um, an energy battle in these ice arenas. We always encourage the use of bundling projects together in GAS, Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. So I mentioned LED lighting. That's a, that's a um, quick payback item. Variable frequency drives on your motors, um, occupancy sensors. These are things that don't usually don't cost a whole heck of a lot and pay for themselves in a year, two years, three years. And then you've got your long-term payback items, your boilers, uh, renewables. Uh, we just completed a project where they put in a new boiler in a library, average size library, and the boiler was $157,000, had a 40-year payback. And by the way, these longer-term payback items, and I've been mayor, I've been mayor since 2007. I have received absolutely zero emails from constituents saying, you know, Mayor, you ought to replace that boiler in City Hall. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. I have received lots of emails saying, um, put in new playground equipment, put in a, put in a sidewalk, do other um, more pressing items in, in the minds of the public. So you have, you have these playground and sidewalks um, versus boilers and more uh, behind the scenes important uh, and very costly items. So, so oftentimes um, you may have a city council that says, you know, maybe we ought to replace that playground equipment before we, we uh, get to the boiler. The boilers we got people that are, uh, they'll, they'll slap some duct tape on it, some gum and some paper clips, so they'll get it going through another January. <laughs> and by the way, you know that boiler is probably going to uh, stop working on the coldest day in January, right? So, um, so anyways, you have, you can bundle these projects together and get these uh, low cost, quick payback items to help pay for the longer payback items. These low cost uh, items may be, they cost $3, they save $10, so they're, they're cash positive very quickly, and they help pay for these longer uh, payback items that cost $10 and save $3. So an example here is uh, we're completing a project in um, on one of the Minsky campuses. They have some theater lighting, it's been on their to-do list, forever. It costs $100,000 to do theater lighting. The payback is over a hundred years, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's not really going to pay for itself, but it needed to be done. So they threw it into their, um, their bundled projects and had uh, combined it with a lot of these other things that are paying for themselves in a much quicker item or a quicker way and were able to, to accomplish it in that manner. So it's a strategy. Guaranteed Energy Savings Program is a strategy to reduce your energy use, to reduce your operation and maintenance costs, renew your facility infrastructure, uh, occupant comfort, safety and health, as I mentioned, and achieve those greenhouse gas emissions, create jobs in your community, and use renewables. So what exactly is the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program? As I mentioned, it's a State Department of Commerce program. Um, and the State Department of Commerce provides technical, financial, and contractual assistance to cities, counties, and schools to do these energy efficiency and uh, renewable measures. So what the state has done 
is they've created a master contract and they have 11 pre-qualified energy service companies or ESCOs, energy service companies, that have signed on to this master contract that spells out the terms and conditions for these types of projects. They have um, a RFP template. All of these documents, by the way, have been vetted by the Attorney General. They've been vetted by uh, the Department of Administration that um, has been doing large-scale energy projects for a long, long time. Uh, so they have um, a template for RFP, and you are well aware uh, the challenges of creating an RFP from from scratch when you're just looking at a your computer and there's a blank uh, white screen there and creating an RFP. What to put in there, Keena? You were just dealing with this with Community Solar uh, not too long ago. It's really challenging. So to have a template um, that you can start with is a real benefit. And then um, a template work order contract for uh, once you start the project with the with the ESCOs. And these, these documents um, have been designed with the local government in mind. So you can do, right now you can do a performance contract without using GASP. And, um, and the, uh, the company, whatever company you're working with, will present you with a contract uh, that you would naturally have to review closely and have your uh, city attorney review closely. But what a uh, few benefits to the guest process is that, number one, it's open book pricing with maximum markups and fees. Open book pricing so you know exactly what you're paying for. There's competitive bidding of trade work and equipment with pre-qualified subcontractors. And these subcontractors, uh, if you've been working with uh, uh, a subcontractor in your town um, who you work well with, you can, you can encourage that subcontractor to um, become pre-qualified under the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. It's right there in the name, guaranteed energy savings, right there. So, so uh, the the ESCO uh, says what the guarantee, what the um, energy savings is going to be. They guarantee to deliver it, and if they do not, then they cut a check to the city. In order to know if you're um, hitting the mark. If uh, those say we call for measurement, we have guidelines on measurement and verification, uh, what that should look like. We have pro forma guidelines, make sure um, that the project is going to pay for itself, and then an annual measurement and verification report. Are all those things that you just mentioned in that last slide on the Department of Commerce website? Absolutely, and all of this uh, information, including frequently asked questions, is on as well. Clean Energy Resource Teams. Uh, so that, I suspect they're both on Commerce and the CERTS website, and I can get you um, additional information. There's handouts in the back on guests as well as a whole bunch of other things from today's program. Thanks. It, and um, in case that question was not picked up uh, online, it was, um, is the information on the Commerce website. So I apologize if this screen is a little bit hard to read, but what I want to convey to you is that there's uh, some steps. There's about five or six through. Um, the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. The first one is just having me and someone from the Department of Commerce out to your city. 
we will review your B3 benchmarking data and add notes um, before the presentation, but I would uh, agree wholeheartedly that putting your information into B3 or, or any uh, of, of the benchmarking programs is really critical to see whether or not you have uh, a viable project. So we'll come out and we'll meet with you. We'll look at your energy usage, um, see what your goals are, and, um, and help you make a determination of whether uh, there's a project there. Uh, um, the milestone here is that uh, your council will pass a joint powers agreement with the Department of Commerce. That just simply allows you to access these template documents and uh, move forward. We'll then help you define what your project goals are. Is it reducing greenhouse gas emissions, meeting other um, energy goals? Is it to create jobs in your community? Um, is it health and safety comfort? What exactly is it? Um, you will uh, then uh, issue an RFP. And I should say the, the State Department of Commerce is working with you hand in hand throughout this entire process. A energy service company will be selected. They will do a preliminary grade audit. Uh, go through the buildings that you identify what they want to look at in your RFP, and they'll things that could happen, that, uh, that uh, could be projects. Um, you will then, with the assistance of things, we're ready to go for it, or you'll say, you know, we want to do A, then come back and give you a uh, price um, and, uh, and what the savings are, and you're on your way. And again, all of this information is uh, on the handout and online as well. These are the 11 pre-qualified energy services companies, some pretty recognizable names. Forms Contracting has been around for about 20 or 30 years. Yes, it's been around for about two years or so. Um, so, Amoresco, Honeywell, Johnson Controls, Train, companies that I suspect you have been working with in one way or another. Some of the benefits of the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program renews your infrastructure. You got to replace that boiler sometime, right? Um, so it's a complete process, A to Z, right? From the very first day we meet with you all the way through 15 years of measurement and verification. It repurposes your 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 dollars. Um, you can use uh, so uh, typically a typical way to finance these projects is through a lease purchase. Where, um, where the uh, ESCO will go out and competitively bid the financing, and you'll pay a, a lease payment that will be paid for by the savings. But really, you can pay for this any way you want to. If you have reserve funds or if you want to bond for it, um, that's up to the city. So, Less vulnerability to, to uh, roller coaster energy prices, weather, equipment failure, uh, progress in meeting your goals. This is this is I just started with this. Uh, energy efficient buildings is best practice numero uno uh, for for green step cities. So keep that in mind. So meeting your green your green step best practices reduces your taxpayer risk. Here you have the Department of Commerce. Uh, with with vetted uh, documents and the Department of Commerce providing you technical assistance. You may have done performance contracting in the past, or you may have someone on your staff that have done it, uh, or you may not have. These are oftentimes million dollar, couple million dollars or more projects, and so they're complex. 
and it's just good to have someone on your side um, that is keeping the local government's interests in mind. And again, last but not least, the guarantee on the energy savings. So we've, we've had a number of local governments that have been interested so far. Uh, Bemidji and City of Rochester, uh, Tracy, a city, a pretty small city. Uh, Brainerd just signed on the other day, and um, a few counties and uh, and state entities as well. We have about 20 sites, uh, 600 buildings. I think it's about 20,000 square feet of buildings that are uh, in the guest, somewhere in the guest province so far. Bemidji just wrapped up their project. They did a whole ton of stuff, uh, HVAC, interior lightings, uh, changing the LEDs, million dollars, almost a million dollars. No, I was going to say a million dollars of street lights, but actually the this is uh, this is interesting. Uh, the engineering estimate uh, when the company first looked at their street lights, they said it's going to cost nine hundred thousand dollars to do your street lights. So under the guest process, the ESCO, the energy service company, has to competitively bid. Um, for the for that subcontract, and so they did, and so the engineering estimate nine hundred thousand. The bid came in at a little over five hundred thousand. So in this case, and and under the normal uh, the normal outside of general contractor could bid. Oftentimes, I'm told they, there is no bidding. Um, in guests, there is competitively bidding. That competitively bid came in three hundred to four hundred thousand less than the engineering estimate. In the guest process, that money goes to the city. It does not go to the company. Um, so that's three hundred thousand plus that the city can uh, save on the project or they can expand the scope of the project. So um, you can see what Mayor Rita Albright had to say. Mayor of Bemidji, we're making two million in upgrades to buildings and street lights without burdening our taxpayers. Again, no bonding, no need to raise the levy. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Or are we taking questions at the end? We have a few questions now. Sure, whenever you prefer. Mr. Sure. Schultz. Yeah. I, I think you said on one of your slides that the Department of Commerce is providing technical, financial, financial assistance. What is the financial assistance? I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, so, so the, um, and can they hear the, the question? Repeat so I mentioned the um, I mentioned that the State Department of Commerce provides technical, financial, and contractual assistance. And the question is, well, what's the financial um, assistance? And I should have clarified that because the Department of Commerce, the state, does not cut you a check. Um, and so that's that. I want to make that clear. The financial assistance is that they help you work through. The, the project itself so that the project pays for itself. They just really crunch on the numbers, the energy savings, um, and uh, and help guide you through the, uh, the lease purchase arrangement if that's indeed the, the direction that the city wants to proceed in. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Is there a cap on payback for the number of years the project will take? 25 years is the cap. Uh, yeah, what is the cap on the payback is the question. 25 years is um, state law says uh, what the cap should be in it. And again, typically 15 or 20. Is there a minimum for size of the project? Uh, the only the minimum for the size of the project is that 300,000 threshold, approximately. Uh, and 
Yeah, that's that's it. My question is, so for folks to be able to utilize that master contract process, then do they have to be like participating in this project? What are these particular projects? Or can, because like the train was on there, can the cities utilize the train contract even if they aren't fully engaged in the um, GSP process? Does that make sense? If the question is, can you utilize the um, the master contract, and I assume the other uh, templates, um, without going through the guest process, and the answer is no. You have to pass the joint powers agreement, and that gives you access to these templates and the master contract itself. So, um, more of a there's a question and a comment. So. Since you mentioned train, Jeff D. Walter Train mentions that along with guests, it might be helpful to point out that there are also other options for non-guaranteed energy projects that can be financed using programs through the St. Paul Port Authority. These projects are still reviewed and vetted by multiple entities, but removing the guarantee substantially reduces the project cost by reducing risk, legal, etc. The um, measurement and verification can still apply as well good approach to get as low cost to financing um, for projects and to mediate projects. Um, and then the question though from Julie Moore, what is the best way to determine predicted energy savings? What is the best way to determine predicted energy savings? What is the best way to determine predicted energy savings? Boy, that one might be, I'm going to throw that one out to the audience. Uh, Katie, Katie's uh, raising her hand. If I understand the question, I think that ties back to the investment grade audit that the ESCO would conduct at the beginning before any project uh, would be undertaken. The part of that investment grade audit would be identifying projects as well as identifying the cost and the predicted savings. And I think that ESCOs uh, or you know, ener energy contractors in general would uh, you know, have kind of rigorous uh, formulas that they need, that they use to determine what those savings are. Sure, that I think that's question. exactly right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. now have um, Mike Myers. He works with Excel Energy. And he's going to share some of the great programs. I mean, the one thing that you really need to think about is that as you go down this um, you know, first benchmark, then you, you know, get an evaluation of how you're going to do the, the project. And um, it's very important to consider the rebates that are out there from the utility companies to, for doing this work. And when you do the guaranteed energy savings program that's built into all of that, they calculate all of that. Um, but there's incredible programs. Um, it's not like we need to go out and create more programs. We just need to make sure that we point out to folks. Am I not? Am I too close? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's just too close for the camera. Um, so, you know, there's lots of really great programs out there, no matter who your utility is. Um, obviously, Excel Energy is um, one of the bigger uh, utilities in the state and in lots of different pockets all over the state, not just here in the metro. Um, has a number of really, really great programs for cities and also for you if residents and your businesses get connected to some programs that will help save them energy as well. Uh, I think Mike's going to focus on the ones for the cities, but um, uh, you know, pay attention because there's lots of really great programs. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, folks. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to share our message with you uh, here and with the folks on the web. Uh, here we go. Get our slides loaded up here. And I know we're probably a little behind on the schedule. So, uh, um, so I'll, try, I'll try to kind of rifle through this quickly to give you a little bit of time back here. Uh, but the 
messages previous speakers really covers a lot of, of, of uh, doves nicely with what our offer is all about and uh, in the commercial rebate programs uh, we really <clears throat> we want to help facilitate uh, implementation of energy efficiency projects that's really the whole purpose of the rebate program so uh, we'll go into a little more specifics as to what we're offering and how you can access that and some of the resources that the client group and Excel Energy provides you to take advantage of our program. So we'll move forward here. But our, uh, our, all of our business energy efficiency programs and rebates. We'll touch on a, a brand new program that's our, our multifamily building efficiency. That kind of marries uh, commercial and residential uh, aspects of, uh, of the rebate process. We'll talk a little bit about partners in energy, and then I think uh, there's a slide on the B B3 buildings program too. Very briefly, we'll touch on that. Well, there's there's benefits to everybody uh, in in pursuing energy efficiency improvement, and particularly working through Excel Energy, working through us. To recognize those projects, uh, we've been doing mid 80s at Excel, offering uh, rebate programs for energy efficiency improvements that we've been doing a long time. We're pretty good at it. A uh, good part of the challenge has been getting more people to participate. And in the past, we've left that a lot up to individuals going to the website seeking out applications and things like this to, to uh, self-serve. And uh, that's changed uh, now quite significantly. I'm part of a, of a team of people, uh, a dozen or more, and uh, I'm a field person for Excel. Uh, I have a colleague that's in the field as well, and our, our exclusive job is to work with, uh, engage participation in our energy efficiency program. So. We'll do the work for you. We just need to uh, plug in. We need to, to know what uh, what your plans are, and be sure that you're aware that we're available to help you. So uh, we're funded by uh, essentially a, a, a SIP rider that, that uh, all ratepayers pay into uh, to uh, uh, to promote conservation, energy conservation. So in a sense. Uh, Participating in our programs allows you to get some of your money back that you put into that program, so that's good motivation. It's about the money. I think the uh, the real benefits result from the data that we provide from the programs, uh, and that's really designed to help you make a more informed decision on, on a project um, where you have options from which you can choose. So. Uh, typically, you have a more energy efficient option that you can select, and you have a less energy efficient option that's cheaper. And what we're trying to do is to, to uh, get you enough information and a little bit of rebate money to, to bump you into that more energy efficient choice. So that's really the sweet spot we're, we're seeking, is to try to get you on the cutting edge of efficiency. Uh, it's really not hard to save energy, you know. I just recently myself replaced a 50-year-old furnace in my house, right, that was very inefficient, and I did not go with the most energy efficient furnace, I went with an 80% efficient, but it's way more efficient than my old furnace, it didn't qualify for a rebate. Uh, so, you know, what we want to try to do with our rebates is make the case to go from 80 to the 90% efficient furnace, to really to push the envelope. That's what we're trying to, to go. So uh, we provide information that helps you make informed decisions as to whether or not it makes sense for you to make that efficiency. And that's uh, in the form of energy savings data and in uh, rebate money. I say it's good for your brand. Uh, more and more, uh, the whole notion of being green is important to consumers. Um, and being able to show your progress uh, in, in benchmarking is a part of that. 
Uh, but having specific project related information that points to the amount of energy saved and the dollars saved from a, a third party, from us, you know, somebody that's reputable and, and not biased in uh, making those kinds of calculations, uh, it can be valuable to put that forward in your websites or otherwise to, to just make sure that you're adding legitimacy to your claim of being a good steward of our environment. And finally, uh, and not least importantly, uh, pursuing energy efficiency helps us keep rates low for people. Um, it helps us avoid building, uh, building uh, additional power plants. This is thanks to you and your uh, participation in our programs. Uh, to date, we've, uh, we've been able to save enough through our programs to, to avoid building 11 mid-sized power plants in Minnesota, which is significant. So thank you for your participation. <laughs> and we, you know, again, we hope that you continue and go forward. We have a lot of choices. Um, Xcel Energy in the, in the demand side management world has one of the largest portfolios of, of uh, energy saving programs for all the utilities in the U.S. So uh, we work with folks both in electricity and natural gas in our service territories. Um, so we have more than 90 electricity programs and 45 natural gas programs. And we'll go into each one of those in great detail here. <laughs> now, we'll, we'll pick out a few that I think will make the most sense to, to you as cities. But again, uh, we have residential programs that are separate from our commercial. I'm going to touch on just the ones that are, oops, me. They're probably most pertinent to you. But any questions that you have, we have literature in the back that describes all of our programs. <clears throat> Again, electric and gas uh, is the focus of, of uh, you know, depending on your whether or not you're in our service territory. Um, there are many equipment specific programs. And the rebates are based on a couple of different uh, sort of, of, of uh, rules, uh, prescriptive and, and custom. And the, the short story there is that anything that does not fit the prescriptive mold for rebate, uh, we can evaluate so we may rebate that. Uh, the, the idea here is that we need to do some calculations on the custom side. So if it's not something that we see a lot of, uh, we need to uh, to have engineers evaluate the, the proposal and make the determination of what the rebate amount is. So we want you to get involved with us before a purchase decision is made. It's, it's critical. So the earlier in the process you can engage us, the better. To, to, we can for sure then look at all of our options. But we have holistic programs that uh, really take an umbrella approach to capturing rebates from every subset is an audit where we will fund um, essentially your your search for candidate opportunities. If you're not certain uh, of what, uh, what you might want to look at for energy savings, we can have a study performed or an audit that will give you a, a punch list. Then finally, load management or load response. Uh, it's not really energy efficiency, but it's more sort of a behavioral thing, like uh, the saver switch, for example. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I think maybe you're familiar with the saver switch for your air conditioning at home, where it will turn it on and off. Uh, so that's uh, another way for us to essentially control the fan. A few of the, the programs that we offer, um, the next slides here, I'll uh, I'll just pick a few of them out that really make the most sense, I think, for cities and just across the board. Lighting has been mentioned a number of times. Uh, it's low hanging fruit. It's an uh, area of, of great uh, effort and, and improvement from the, uh, the evolution of the LED. Uh, we have all kinds of rebates that surround lighting and, and all kinds of lighting. So any kind of interior applications, exterior, street lighting, uh, you name it, if there's a project you want to be involved with you on that, and there's probably some rebate dollars available based on the technology as it is today. So 
So please do get in touch with us uh, to make sure you're taking advantage of, of these options that are available. Uh, make one now with um, LEDs. It's kind of the marriage of the, the lights and the controls is the next step in the process of evolution for, for technology and lighting. And there's great uh, potential for LEDs to, to they lend themselves well to being controlled. So uh, that's kind of anybody who's put LEDs already in their buildings. Next step will be to look at upgrading to LEDs that can be controlled. Uh, a lot of this is custom, so again, in the rebate end of things, we need to be sure that we're engaged with you before you make your purchasing decisions. Here's a case study. Um, shows what, what kind of savings. I don't know if you can read that very well. Maybe a little blurry. So this is the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and they upgraded to uh, LEDs not too long ago. But you can see that the... Uh, the payback was less than one year in the project, and it was almost a $400,000 project. So what we have here is, is a situation where the longer they would wait to Im implement this project, the more money they would waste or spend uh, when they could be saving, you see, uh, $150,000 a year, um, and, and you know have the, the other half essentially covered by rebate. Uh, they essentially are, are wasting that 150000 a year for every year they delay implementing. It's, it's, a big, it's a big deal. It really, it's one of those things that's kind of unique about energy efficiency projects is that the, uh, it's not just the simple payback, but it's the lifetime cost. And, and there's a penalty, if you want to call it that, for not acting. So a little motivation. You see what... Um, beyond lighting, and we, we see a lot of studies in, in city buildings, uh, and, um, it's not necessarily easy to identify opportunities for energy efficiency improvement. So a study can essentially provide you with that list of, of opportunities. And uh, the benchmarking we've talked about a lot, certainly critical part of the process. Uh, I know I've heard, heard it mentioned many times that you can't control what you don't measure. So the measurement part is, is very important. Uh, and studies generally will contain a benchmark. So it's a good way to start the process. So we strongly encourage that uh, you, you consider having a study performed. The turnkey services study is, is one that I recommend most often. It's an ASHRAE Level 1 assessment. Uh, ASHRAE Level 1 is kind of a difficult thing to, to quantify if you want to look online and try to determine what's involved in that. But it's, it's essentially a whole building review, uh, not including process. So if it's a manufacturing facility, it doesn't look at the machines that make the, the widgets. It does look at the, the building, the envelope, the air conditioning, and the lighting. And that's on the typical plug load, so like computer. But there's a small charge associated with that assessment, typically $600 for, for most reasonable sized buildings. Uh, we subsidize the rest, so the audit is worth more than 600 bucks, but that's the charge that we pass along to our customers to perform it. Uh, and it involves a, uh, an, an assessment and audit and then a report, uh, feedback uh, appointment that lays out the findings from the audit. Um, implementation services is another area talking about how to navigate the, the, the spec creation and, and creating bids and, and uh, can be very difficult and challenging. That's part of what this, this service will provide too is working with vendors Mary and you two vendors are rec making recommendations, if you wish, uh, to help you through the entire process. St. Paul Youth Services went through the, the program, and in the turnkey there were five or so energy conservation opportunities, ECOs, that were identified and implemented, resulting in 
and what you can see here, rebates and, and uh, some substantial energy savings from the effort. So they were able to, take, to implement this turnkey and have a number of, of uh, what says five, I guess, projects with rebates identified. And they took advantage of all those things. So it's just a great program. We, we, I, I highly recommend it. Recommissioning is the other study program that really involves um, a much deeper dive into a particular type of process in, in the facility, typically HVAC, HVAC. Also covers lighting, but in buildings where there are more complicated systems for controlling the environment, oftentimes the systems are not working well together uh, or maybe have never been checked to make sure they're performing optimally. So what the recommissioning study does investigates that and comes up with a, a report then on how to uh, how to optimize the performance of those systems. So those studies are, are typically uh, they're performed by an authority, you know, a third party uh, that has to meet a certain qualification of, of work product to uh, for us to, to fund them, but we'll pay up to 75% of the study cost, uh, not to exceed $25,000. That's a pre-approval is required there. So we look at the proposal from the authority to you, and we, we gauge how much energy saving potential there is, and then we fund the study accordingly. So the more energy saving potential we see uh, in the proposal, or from the proposal, the higher we'll fund the study. Bottom line is these things will generally pay for themselves over and above just with no and low cost uh, opportunities that are identified. So I think for government buildings, and we do a lot of this, you know, recommissioning in in, uh, in community centers and in, in government buildings, city buildings, um, uh, shops, maintenance facilities, um, schools, also big area for recommissioning. Here's a case study of a that. Uh, Recommissioning study was was performed, and all this is available on the web. And I know there's some literature in the back. Uh, I don't know if we brought the case study data, but we can surely I can provide that to you if you, have, if you want to have the details. Um, but uh, we see a lot of recommissioning done in schools to to great benefit. The other thing I want to touch on kind of quickly here in our rebate programs is new construction. So. From a city's perspective, I think uh, certainly applying to new city facilities, but also to attract uh, businesses and, and industry into your city to make sure that, that you're all aware that these where and they're free, uh, and their intent is to work in the design phase of, of new buildings to make sure that the uh, end product is, is optimally efficient. And it incorporates really a, um, all of the rebates and all of the information up front to the owners to help them make these decisions in a, in a more intelligent manner. So uh, really um, wonderful programs. I don't know if any of you participated, just a show of hands here. Okay, great. Good, good. You know, I think that's uh, it's one of those things that I try to get the message out as often as possible. Mm -hmm. People are just not aware that these programs are existing and how easy they are to use and how productive they can be. So uh, I strongly encourage you to, to be, be familiar as city officials uh, that these programs are there and uh, can, can really be used to advantage for you. Uh, and there's two different types that they're really kind of separated by size. Under 50,000 square feet is EEB and 50,000 and above is EDA. We work with the white group on, on EDA, and you, some of you are familiar with the white group. Uh, we'll talk a little bit there in the, involved in the B3 program, too. Uh, but they do a wonderful job in EDA, and then Franklin Energy does EEB for us in partners. Here's an EDA case study. Uh, this is an education center. This is one of our older ones, but if you look at benchmarking, here's one of the, the uh, Sort of the units of benchmarking, energy intensity, real easy to calculate. You know, it's just a matter of your, your how much energy you consume with the square footage of your facility. 
it alone is a good number for you to understand uh, as a benchmark, but uh, it's, it's certainly the unit that they use and we use to, to gauge the performance of a building in, in total. Um, but this shows the impact, what it's say the EDA program had from a, an average baseline for that building type to the one that was designed through EDA in partnership with the EDA program. Uh, the significant, significantly more efficient building resulted from, from uh, at least in part, from cooperation with the EDA program. Load management is uh, for demand response. Uh, the two other areas that I don't often get involved in personally, but they're available and, and certainly things that, that people should be taking advantage of where applicable. The saver switch for business. We have the same program for businesses that we do for residents. And then also a, a peak there, a load shed program for uh, facilities that, uh, that can have backup generation capability and can, when we call during periods of peak demand, peak load on our system, they can shed 50 kilowatts or more uh, at a moment's notice and either suspend operations or switch to their alternate power source. And there's rate savings associated with that. So that's those are two things that if you know I mean you want to be aware of and uh, if ap applicable are very easy to implement. So the next step is to contact us and I think um, it's always the, the message I try to leave with everybody that, that I talk to is to just keep us involved. If you have any questions about where we fit or how we fit or why and what we can do for you, call this to the 800 number or if you go online you send us an email. Uh, we have a, a team really dedicated to working with you on energy efficiency and, and to answer questions that you have about these programs. Uh, so please use us. You know, we're, we're available. I think we fit so well with these other of the speakers we're talking about your programs. Uh, we should be a, an integral part of, of all of those processes for sure. Okay, well, the multifamily building efficiency program, brand new. Von Pfeiffer is, is uh, responsible for it. It's a wonderful new opportunity for us to reach commercial properties uh, with common spaces. So uh, where there's residential and commercial blend, it allows us to, to pursue energy efficiency at those locations in a way that we have not really been able easily to do in the past. So I'm very excited about it. I know that uh, I think it'll be very good for for many, many commercial and residential buildings, multifamily buildings, to, to take advantage more so of our energy rebate programs that they have been able to in the past. Uh, it marries utilities, so where we have electric and the center point has gas, which happens in a lot of areas. Uh, we can still participate in the program. We do all the work marrying everything together. So it's not an administrative nightmare for people taking advantage of the program. And it leverages both electric and gas savings. So it, it, you know, regardless of whether we're the gas supplier. So it, it's uh, designed in that manner. Uh, it's a one-stop shop. So everything is, is done through the program. Uh, we're not uh, subbing out or parting out. Certain responsibilities is the implementer really walks through the entire process. So it's a whole building audit with some direct installation of energy efficient uh, lighting materials. This is included uh, in the in the process. Uh, and then there are rebates that uh, that can be obtained based on certain levels of energy efficiency improvement that, that are implemented through the program. Again, contact us. You're not going to remember a lot of these details <laughs> for sure. So as long as you know where you can get a hold of us, that's important. And know that we are there. You're not going to get stuck in a in the big machine black hole. Send us. We're dedicated to helping you, and we're just anxious to talk to you. Partners in Energy. Real quick, what is Partners in Energy? I think that's our essentially program in Excel to help cities. Uh, engage and implement plans for energy sustainability and energy efficiency improvements. And are you familiar with Partners in Energy? So, well, you know, it's, it's a kind of a program, it's a high-level program to help you in 
engage in the process. And there's other other paths that you can take too, but we have resources. Uh, and honestly, we're going to more involved even in the other paths. So one way or the other, we're going to get involved. But this is a good way for you to uh, kind of search uh, uh, to probe, I guess, the uh, the starting part of the process for you as a city or community. So these are the things, the benefits that the Partners in Energy provide. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go through every one of those now. I think we're so far behind here. <laughs> I, I don't want to keep us any longer than I have to. More information again at Partners in Energy at XLEnergy.com. B3, uh, this is kind of coming in 2016 is the interaction of the white group and, and bringing essentially your data through the Energy Star Portfolio Manager into the B3 program. So they'll work, the white group is, is, uh, is the facilitator there. And I think there's going to be more information coming on that. But uh, So you won't have to go that alone. There's, there's resources that will help you there. Any questions? We cover material. There's one online. Ken and Pick with um, Nicholas Park. Um, are there any programs to excel that help businesses with their manufacturing and processing of energy? Yes. Um, we can do specific process studies for manufacturers. Um, myself and my colleague, uh, as field engineers, are happy to visit facilities to uh, perform a walkthrough and have a conversation about how we can engage the various programs on the manufacturing side of things. So absolutely yes is the answer to that. And uh, uh, please get in touch with, with uh, Business Solutions Center uh, or myself. I don't put my contact information on there. But going through that the Central 800 number will get to, to us and get to one of us field guys to just request a, uh, a walkthrough essentially to be performed. And we, I love those. I'm an old manufacturing guy myself. so. It's fun to see these plants and these facilities, and uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of different types of processes. So uh, we we have custom efficiency there that, that will engage, and uh, quite often there's rebates in areas that people don't imagine that there are available for sure. Yes, ma'am. The back. About the Partners in Energy program, I want to say that uh, Maplewood has been going through that process, and my understanding it's been a great experience for them. Um, so Sean Finwell would be the person to talk to if you want to know more about it. So I'm wondering what the application process is and like when do you have open rounds for a city? You know, I think there was um, next round of applications <coughs> due in March 2016. That's It's not a, a program that I'm real familiar with, and I don't know if if Yvonne can speak to that more, if you don't mind, Yvonne. Thank you. Uh, the next round of applications is in March of 2016. You can get more information on the website, xlnergy.com slash partners in energy. The application is posted on the website. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, Tina's here too. She's working actively in the partners in energy. And Shannon, who put in the call, is in the process of well several communities that are actively working with us in developing their energy action plans. So looking forward to more. Questions? Thank you again for all of your attention and participation. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I, I I announced like a bunch of things at the beginning. We're gonna have a quiz. Does everybody remember <laughs> the things that I know? No. Um, so I'm gonna pass these around. Um, again, we'll send an email out. But for folks in the room um, to remember the things that I talked about. Can you help me? Thanks, Mike. So the Sustainable Community Partnership. If you're in a city and you want to work. Um, with the college or uh, the University of St. Thomas to help you um, forward sustainability goals. Um, there's a sheet coming around. Take one if you're interested. If you're not, leave it. We'll share it with others. Um, then the Metro Cert annual event is coming up next week, next Thursday at the Science Museum. It's going to be a great program with an opportunity to 
was an opportunity to uh, provide input for the uh, Minnesota 2025 Energy Action Plan. Um, there is also a survey that was included in our newsletter that just went out yesterday. So you can take the, if you can't come, you can take the survey and provide some input as well. The CERT um, statewide seed grants um, available at every corner of the state from Halleck to Winona and Marshall to Grand Marais. Does that cover pretty much? Um, and so folks to, to recall to remember that if you have a, if you're interested in a seed grant question. Um, about the seed grant, and I was looking at that, I was wondering, it said that it um, was up to five thousand dollars and it could only be used for technical assistance labor charges it looks like. It. Not necessarily just technical assistance. It can only be for labor, though. You can't buy a computer or a something. You can't buy a sink with it. It's labor only. But the labor could be a consultant to do a feasibility study about um, whatever kind of energy project. It has to be related to a clean energy project. To a specific project. And so my question is, um, for instance, we're a part of the energy in our community and what we really need technical assistance with is like helping to do outreach about in general those kinds of those kinds of programs as long as learning if that would be eligible or does it have to be for I have this building and we want to do XYZ with it. No, you can apply for um, outreach education, those kinds of things if that's what you're needing and it's to pay for the labor to do that. Right. That is acceptable. I don't know for your region what the steering committee has set as priorities for what they're really looking for to fund. Because each region, where there are seven regions, has $20,000, not a lot of money. And so it's competitive. And for different regions, it's more or less competitive. It's a little more competitive in the metro because we have the 11 county metro area. We often get 20 to 40 applications. Some of the regions get five to 10. So it really depends on which region you're in um, as far as kind of what count or you know what they're looking for. Each steering committee sets their priorities for what they're trying to do. The other thing that I well she has questions on that you'd be in southwest so she could South east. Or east. So you should talk to Michelle Palm. Um, on the website, if you go to the website you can find the Southeast coordinator, her name is Michelle Palm and ask her. She'll be able to tell you what the priorities are for that region. The one last thing that I want to promote and talk about is next Thursday in addition to being the Metro Third annual uh, event is the um, closing of an application process. We are looking for a community partner with the Energy Star Challenge um, for um, Minnesota. We're looking for a community that really wants to work with its businesses to help them get connected to resources to do Energy Star um, certification of their building. So um, October 22nd, Abby Finnis, wave your hand. If you have questions, talk to Abby Finnis um, or Laura Milberg in the back from the PCA. Um, I know there are a couple of cities that are considering, but um, you know it's a really great opportunity if you want to help your businesses get um, energy star buildings. And then Patrick is going to you want to yeah I'm going to introduce you. Okay, Patrick's going to introduce himself. <laughs> we just have a few minutes, so okay. I'm going to move along. Um, so just a short, quick testimonial case study on cities that have done a good job with benchmarking with B3. Um, and so yeah, I'm Patrick Huff with the Great Plains Institute. Um, so myself and then Maddie Nogard, we did a little survey of cities because we were wondering, so what was the secret to keeping B3 up to date and then what benefits have those cities seen to have done it? So um, as mentioned before, Allison mentioned um, there's public reporting the Rating disclosure on B3, so you can look and see how current cities are, what their benchmark index is, and all sorts of things. And so we went through there and had some categories. We looked how fresh cities were, if they had a history of keeping B3 up to date. And so for the cities that we narrowed down and found that they were doing this well, we sent out some questions, and some of the responses we got back um, were from Brainerd, Rochester, Edina, and Woodbury. Um, so the first question was, what was their system for keeping it up to date? And what we found across the board was it was someone who was in who was the first contact for receiving utility bills. So someone in administration, finance, finance, a maintenance supervisor. So they were always typically someone who was the first contact for an energy bill. They were not removed at all. And so 
that was well said by Rochester City Planner. The department directly associated with the financial stability of the community is the best party to be responsible for managing input. Our city was recognized as the most up-to-date E3 data entry provider because the system accountants are entering numbers. As a planner, I'm not directly involved in the payment system. If I had to enter data, it would already be once removed from the data source. And so that really speaks true to that. Um, and that's what we recommend. And so for the entry, having someone who is the person who hits that first and has the background of entry. But then once you have it entered, it's kind of meaningless just to have the data. You need to have someone to review it. So there needs to be a two-step process. And so once it's entered by someone with finance or with data entry, you need to have someone review it. So once you have it entered, to make it meaningful, you need to have someone with technical knowledge review it. So that could be facility managers, public work director, building manager, sustainability director, so that they're reviewing it, they're making reports and other things that can benefit the city. And so then the second question that we ask these cities are, what are some of the um, benefits? And so said well by Edina, data is used to track trends and spot anomalous energy use. Environmental ear engineers provide an annual report on trends to staff in the Energy Environment Commission to keep the issue current. And so they take the reports that B3 generates and they use that to benefit their city and keep themselves updated and to look for anomalies. Um, and they can use it as, so the city of Brainerd said, as Peter said, they're signed up and looking at guests. And so in the future, they're going to look at B3 to help them prioritize then what cities they want to possibly focus in with the guest project. Um, and then the same thing with Woodbury with just using it to target buildings that have waste energy. So that's all then. And we want to thank you. And I guess last, this is also being recorded with help from the U.S. Green Building Council. And so, Steve, do you want to just say a word about where people can find that once all the editing is complete? And so, uh, This is pretty simple, but uh, the U.S. Green Building Council in Minnesota has created a, a video channel online. We call it the Green Building Channel. So if you go to greenbuildingchannel.org, you'll see every presentation that we've recorded in the last two years. Uh, going up online, it takes me about two weeks usually to get something turned around and edited. But uh, what we'll do is put in the slides and have uh, a recording of all of our speakers. And it's a great way uh, if you have people maybe in your office or something like that that you wish would have seen this, you'll be able to go find it online and, and forward it to them. So I'll, uh, once we get this up online, uh, I'll send Patrick a link and you're happy to send it out to everybody in the crowd. Yep. And so on Great Plains Institute website, betterenergy.org, we have kind of a, um, a blog that is a catalog of past webinars and um, workshop webinars. And so all the resources from today will be on that website. So the resources will be up there. And I'll put up uh, a video recording. But then once Steve makes it so much better, we'll put his up there. Um, and so we'll be, I'll email that out um, as a follow-up email. Um, yeah. Hey, Steve, can I get continuing education credit at the greenbuildingchannel.org? <laughs> as a matter of fact, Kurt, you can get two hours of continuing education credit for watching today's presentation. Wow. Yeah, so what was asked is if you can get continuing education credit for watching this. And yes, you can get two hours worth of it. So any other announcements or anything? No? I guess then we're done. So thanks for attending. And the next workshop is November 8th, 13th, the second, the second, the third Tuesday of November, um, oh, November 10th, right up there, and on Shoreland Sample Ordinances. And the, the, uh, the DNR is helping us with that one.